Hello all YouTubers, I am The Weather Dude. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Thank you all for tuning back into this weather presentation and hurricane discussion for May 25th, 2020. Before I get on with today's video, however, I would ask that you please do subscribe because sadly, tons of my watch time has been coming from unsubscribed viewers. We are on our way to our next goal of 600 subscribers and thank you guys so much, by the way, for 500 subscribers. Let's get to our next goal of 600 subscribers. All right, so please do uh, subscribe and also as applies to every single one of you please watch the whole video as well as liking and sharing the video thank you now let's get on with today's video all right so let's get started so this is signs of a potentially hyperactive 2020 atlantic hurricane season forecast and also my 7th 2020 Atlantic hurricane season forecast. Probably about a week or eight days from now, I'll be doing my final hurricane outlook, kind of like my plan. So probably maybe June 1st or the 2nd around that time. Um, I will be doing like a little mini forecast throughout the season, but primarily um, after the next video, after my 8th forecast, which will be my final forecast. Um, after that, I'll, pr I'll probably be doing discussions throughout the season, but still be doing a little mini forecast uh, here and there. So let's get started. So this is my... Here's our latest update. We got another source added to here as well as my updated forecast. All right, so let's get into it here. So um, 2020 Atlantic hurricane season outlook number seven. So as you can see on the left, uh, my forecast is now 15 to 20 named storms, eight to 11 hurricanes, three to seven major hurricanes, as well as three to seven US impacts. Um, AccuWeather, I don't believe they've gotten an update yet. Uh, 14 to 18 named storms, seven to nine hurricanes and two to four major hurricanes with two to, or two to four, excuse me, uh, U.S. impacts. Meanwhile, Colorado State University, I think they're still on their first outlook. 16 named storms, 8 hurricanes, 4 major hurricanes, and they don't do really a U.S. forecast. The weather company also stayed the same here. 18 named storms, 9 hurricanes, 4 major hurricanes, and I would say they always talk about a possible storm impact in the U.S., but they don't really give a forecast either. Seasonal average here, 12 named storms, 6 hurricanes, 3 major hurricanes. Kind of just cut it in half each time here. Um, as I look for the data going back to about 2010, about 10 years ago, I saw that usually two to four storms impact the U.S. each year. That's just from my observations. Penn State calling for 15 to 24 named storms. Uh, they don't do a forecast for hurricanes or major hurricanes, which really surprises me. But they are calling for 15 to 24 named storms. North Carolina State calls for 18 to 22 named storms, 8 to 11 hurricanes, uh, 3 to 5 major hurricanes, as they don't really do a U.S. impact forecast. Uh, here's our new one that we added here. NOAA came out with their forecast. NOAA here looking for 13 to 19 named storms, 6 to 10 hurricanes, 3 to 6 major hurricanes, and U.S. impacts forecast isn't really available. And I will note that uh, NOAA called for a 60% chance for an above average forecast. So that's some um, interesting. Uh, 2019 season, 18 named storms, 6 hurricanes, 3 major hurricanes. And when I looked at the tracking map, about 5 U.S. impacts uh, last year. Um, there were some very small updates. There's not much updates from the Nino 3-4 data from the Bureau of Meteorology. Not much, but there are still some important updates that are from major companies that are worth sticking around for. All right, so here's June. Again, July, kind of everybody's starting to go back towards the left a little bit. And here's August. Um, by August, all the models are below the zero line. Uh, heading towards La Nina, which is in that blue region, like I said in pretty much all my other hurricane videos, Bureau of Meteorology in Australia calls 0 0.8, negative 0.8 La Nina. We call it negative 0.5 as long as it's been there for a great amount of time. But either way, a negative neutral or La Nina, that's that's why we're going to have a potentially very active season because of that absence of El Nino. September, we got at least five models almost in our, in our terms. Uh, we got one, uh, looks like two, three, yeah, four, five models that are in a La Nina uh, phase at this point. By Burr Meteorology Standards, the, there are two models that are at um la nina status and the top model is the borough meteorology model they have their own little model that is their own borough model that is their own uh october here uh again <laughs> all the models are getting really close to la nina but hurricane season will be wrapping up uh, as we head to the month of october and november will start really tapering off um so here is the nino 3 4 region again not much change here all right but the next my final hurricane uh, video will have all the latest updates and forecasts all right, but still, we do have some major updates, all right? This was still dropping into La Nina, according to the borough model here, by late August into September. So um, that, that could potentially mean um, very active hurricane season. And some of the models 
like stick around the zero line some of this big game miles some plunge it way into a deep strong la nina all right so that's really that's very interesting because some of the models go all the way down some models almost like one model almost shoots almost shoots back to an el nino either way though neutral or la nina the absence of el nino is why we'll be having a an active potentially hyperactive hurricane season um here again the chances for are in or in us so chances again our primary one in here is going to be La Nina here, especially toward, by October. September, October, we're going to be at negative, negative 0.9 degrees Celsius. All right, that is definitely La Nina. I mean, I mean they could put 50 40% chance of neutral, but that is definitely La Nina. And El Nino the whole way through, not a chance. Not a chance at all. All right, but neutral chances will be declining through the season, and La Nina chances will be going up as we head throughout the season. So best chances for La Nina will be later in the season, September, October. All right, here's the SST anomalies for Nino 3-4 region. Um, we got negative 0.1 for the SST anomaly according to the bit of borough meteorology here by June. All right, which I really don't agree with that, honestly, because right now we're at negative 0.4 already, which is what they were calling for for August. So once we get those next updates, I'll be some really crucial updating here. Uh, by October, potentially find a negative 0.7 degree Celsius, which is well into La Nina, as you can see indicated by the graphing here, which I definitely do agree with the October forecast. Possibly it could be a little stronger of a La Nina, but we'll have to see. Uh, one thing we can always get updates on is the ocean temperatures. So starting with the ocean temperature anomalies here, as we always do, we start in the Western Atlantic. And before, when I did my last video, all right, the Northern Gulf of Mexico was all covered in blue, all right, with some below average uh, ocean temperatures. That is now flipped. All right, we still have a little region of blue in the middle there, but other than that, we're back to pretty much above average for almost the entire Gulf. Um, the outer rim of the Caribbean, right? So the northern, the eastern, the southern, and the western Caribbean is above average, but most of the Caribbean is pretty much average. And off the southeast coast, from the wake of Arthur, we actually do have oh, some warming up waters. Some waters are warming up. Uh, by the mid-Atlantic coast, though, it's still below average, all right? as the latest map on the right. On the left is May 14th, by the way. On the right is May 25th. As for the actual ocean temperatures here, all right, um... There are some updates, some big changes, especially look at the Gulf of Mexico, some big changes. Uh, but first, starting at the Gulf Stream here, before the 80 degree waters got up to Florida, Georgia, now they go all the way up the coast of the Carolinas here. So that 80 degree water is getting almost up to the tidewater of Virginia there. All right, but it's stopping in North Carolina. But look at the Gulf of Mexico. Look at it now, filled with oranges completely. Before, we couldn't even get yellows in there, it was just some greens. So now we're, I mean, we've completely changed in the course of 10 days. Possibly because of that La Nina, I mean, that, but that more so affects the shear and the dry air. But still, we saw our first traces of 30 degrees Celsius waters in the parts of the Atlantic here. But it's the Pacific that's going to be seeing those really warm waters are near 90 degrees Fahrenheit. By the way, that is in the top right corner of your screen, tracking your potential uh, disturbance, tropical disturbance in the eastern Pacific. So top right of your screen, please consider checking that out. All right, so again, the Gulf of Mexico, well above, well into the 80s at this point. We've really changed. Um, and here, all right, here's the ocean temperature anomalies for the tropical Atlantic. Um, overall, not much change. We have warmed up. I say the anomalies have beginning, been beginning a little bit warmer in the uh, sort of the subtropics up in that region. There's a little bit more reds than there were before. But other than that, I mean, everything is pretty much exactly the same from the way it was on May 14th. Like, you got your scattered out blues. Could it, I mean, the blues, I mean, they pretty much been staying the same. I can't even really notice a change. Um, but maybe some, like, by the Lesser Antilles, maybe some more oranges starting to grow. But other than that, not much change in the tropical Atlantic. But since the anomaly, so you, we know that heading up through August, September, that's when the ocean temperature is going to continue to warm and warm. So if the anomalies haven't moved much, that means the ocean water is going to continue to warm up. And because it's only natural that the ocean temperatures gets warm through this time of year. So before, all right. This is going to pretty much advance to the east, that 80 degree water line. Now it's sitting at about, I want to say 48 degrees uh, west latitude. Now, uh, before it was more so at, you know, 50, 51. So it's been advancing a little bit farther to the east. Um, definitely seeing some changes though by the Lesser Antilles though. 28 degrees Celsius waters versus 27 and 28 before. It's a little warm up there. Definitely a darker stripe of orange has been added widespread. But still, off the coast of Africa, we're still having a little bit of trouble there with the water, the ocean temperature. Uh, Caribbean, latest Caribbean SST values, all right, and the anomalies are 0.3 degrees above average, been on the uptick there for the Caribbean um, over the last few hours. Atlantic MDR, main development region, in case you guys don't know, 
the MDR region is pretty much right where the hurricanes form August, September, right, right in that region. So the, that's the region we're talking about. The MDR, um, about the same. It's been the same ever since, you know, mid-May. Hasn't really moved much at all. Uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so it really hasn't moved since the middle of May. Still 0.1 degrees above average. Uh, North Atlantic, though, is 0.4 degrees below average. That's only because, all right, that's because they're, when I talk about the North Atlantic, it's talking about the whole thing. Like, up through, up, like, almost, almost up through Newfoundland, up through Canada, almost to Greenland. That's what they mean by the entire North Atlantic. You can't really count that because it does count, it factors in some of the colder waters and colder anomalies that are always going to be there up, well up to the north. All right, but still, we do have to look at that map. And it has been near average towards the middle of May. And then it kind of sort of dropped the East Tropical Atlantic. Again, just off the coast of Africa here, we've been dropping a little bit. Um, overall, we've done a pretty good job almost of staying um, near the zero line. We've been maintaining that. We had a big drop in the ocean temperature anomalies there late April and early May. But here it is. This is the big map right here. The Nino 3-4 index, all right? The big drop here. We we are now at 0.4 degrees below average. That is pretty much almost a La Nina. And to think about it, exactly one month ago, uh, April 27th, April 25th, we were at 0.5 degrees above average. We're now almost 0.5 degrees below. So we just completely flip-flopped, like just completely. All right, we dropped a whole degree uh, from last month, all right? And even one and a half months ago, we were up at 0.7. I mean, that was well into an El Nino here. So we really dropped over the past month, month and a half. Huge uh, drop there in the Nino 3-4. And that's going to weaken the shear. That's going to weaken the dry air. And because of the shear and the dry air starting to weaken, that means more intense hurricanes possible. Tropical intensity index by Florida, by the parts of the Bahamas here. We do have some areas of favorable development as well as the Eastern Pacific, um, as well as near the coast of Mexico, Central America. I should say Central America. Um, there could be a little tropical wave developing by Florida. No chance of development. It's just going to move up too much, too much wind shear and some dry air. All right, but still, it still is a tropical wave that will bring several inches of rain to Central and South Florida. Look at the now. This is the, I've introduced this map recently. It's not a brand new map, but I have introduced it recently. Um, all right, and it is called you know, the 26 degree isotherm. So basically, what this means is we know that in the Caribbean, pretty much everywhere. The ocean water is 80 degrees Fahrenheit plus at the surface. Well, this map is saying, how far deep will you go and still find ocean temperatures of 80 degrees plus? Because if you go far deep, far underground in the water, you go below sea level, and you see that the waters are still 80 degrees, even way below the surface, that's what really gets those hurricanes going. Not just an 80 degree sea surface temperature, but a sea subsurface temperature of 80 degrees. So anywhere in this yellow region, so let's start with that yellow region here, much of the Caribbean. That means if you go 100 meters, so for much of the Caribbean, I mean, if you go 100 meters deep, so 300 feet deep, you will still find 80 degree waters. And take a look at the, the orange and red region here from much of the northern Caribbean here, and this little region here as well. 150, so we're talking about, I mean, 450 possibly. You go 400 feet deep, you go 450, 500 feet deep, you're still going to find... Um, ocean temperatures of 80 degrees plus. Now let's talk about that tropical cyclone heat potential. All right, definitely a lot of heat to really, you know, get those tropical systems going, definitely. All right, especially for much of the nor Northern Caribbean. Now I'm also going to show the Gulf of Mexico map because some of this heat is starting to spread to the Gulf of Mexico because before there was nothing there and I didn't bother showing the map. So now we're going to start showing the map for the Gulf of Mexico. This is the same map I showed you before, um, except how far do you have to go um, usually you go about 50 to 75 meters deep. So about, about 150 to possibly 200 feet deep, you might find some, um, ocean temperatures still of eight degrees Fahrenheit plus parts of the Southern Gulf, of Mexico, maybe you can go 300 feet deep and still find it. But that subsurface temperature, see the sea surface temperature, as well as the sea subsurface temperature is 80 degrees plus. That's even more fuel for the hurricane or tropical entity. Um, tropical cyclone heat, not much. I mean, we're starting to see a little bit spill out of the Caribbean into the Gulf, but there is a little bit over to the West, but it's not much. Like, it's it's barely, I mean, it's barely 2040 on the uh, KJCM scale. But still, there's a little bit of tropical cyclone heat starting to flow into the Gulf of Mexico. But one thing that's really absent is the dry air. We just don't have any. 
All right, here's that tropical wave over Florida. All right, there's what might become a disturbance there in the eastern Pacific. All right, and if you haven't already, I also do want you appearing on the top right right now is also my um my how to prepare for hurricane season because hurricane season could be very active. So on the top right there is how to prepare for hurricane season properly. So please consider watching that after this video. But I mean, you really look at it, much of the Atlantic is just the Gulf of Mexico is not that much drier. There's a little pocket. But the Caribbean, the south, I mean, not the, the western Atlantic here, we just don't have dry air. And the dry air that we do have is widely scattered. I mean, there is some towards the north, but it's widely scattered. So these are the signs we're starting to look for. All right, because of those La Nina, potential La Nina conditions. Sheer, it's still early in the season. All right, it's still a little early. Uh, but the sheer, we are expecting it to start go down, and it is. Parts of the Gulf of Mexico, South Florida, um, right there in the Bahamas. But other than that, the wind shear is staying pretty high right now. But on the flip side, you look down towards uh, just south of Mexico there in the eastern Pacific, East Pac, definitely some very low wind shear values. Um, here's the Caribbean here, all right? Uh, the wind shear values just below the average currently. This is across the whole Caribbean. This will go up and down, but overall we are below the average line in terms of wind shear, in terms of uh, vertical shear. I would say the vertical shear means the changing of wind direction with height. So maybe you have winds that's coming from the south at the surface and maybe coming from the west at about 5,000 feet. Speed shear is a change of wind speed with height, meaning the winds could be 10 miles an hour at the surface and then 100 miles an hour um, up 5,000 feet. Just give me an example. The difference that is the higher wind shear that we do have. In terms of our vertical shear, which is the first one I talked about, we still have above average values there for the tropical Atlantic. All right, but still, we, we, this has time to adjust because tropical storms won't form in this region pretty much until late July into August. The one thing we, we can look at is on the GFS model here, the wind shear anomalies over the course of five days. So here it is. This is the 27th of May to June 1st. Overall, the wind shear is pretty much average. We do have some below average pockets of wind shear. So a hurricane could potentially develop. Hey, I made a mask. Look at that. That's pretty cool. Anyway, um, but yes, yeah, so we do have some average to below average wind shear, but we also have some above average shear right where the hurricanes would track, pretty much in that MDR region. That's the 27th to the 1st. Let's look at the 30th of May to June 4th. So a little bit of a change here. All right, a lot of the wind shear has been pushed back west. We have more average conditions, a little bit more favorable. We look towards uh, June 2nd to June 7th, and a huge pocket of below average wind shear, potentially up to 30 knots of wind shear below average. So we could even have a storm try to develop out, out by Africa. It could happen. Dry air also has to be low, but the ocean water is, I think, is a, one of our biggest problems out here. All right, we still have some above average wind shear that we'd have to contend with anyway. But still, some, some pockets of sh below average shear up to 30 knots below average, these are the signs that we're looking for that could occur again later in the season. So we're going to have to keep our eyes on. Um, high pressure, billion to the north. This is, by the way, 15th of June to 22nd of June. We're going to be showing another map of this as well. High pressure there potentially means some tropical systems. Could they track into the Gulf of Mexico? Could they track into the southeast coast? We don't know. All right. Because of that high pressure steering there, all right, I think it's possible that the storm could get steered westward towards the United States southeast coastline because of that high pressure steering, but we're going to have to wait and see. Here's a, another map. This is the 29th of June to the 6th of July. Uh, this is the CFS runs, by the way. Again, tropical, I mean, tropical storms, possibly Gulf of Mexico, southeast coast. It's possible because of the high pressure steering around that. Storm, we're gonna have to wait and see. So there you go. That's it for today's video. Please share this video with your friends and stay tuned for my final eighth forecast, probably coming at the very beginning of June. I'm the weather dude, signing off till next time. Thank you guys for watching.